Hello, this is a discussion roundtable about Locked Room Mysteries today. Crippin' Andrew is trying this out as a new idea for us to hear about some of our favorite mysteries and meet some of our favorite mystery authors as well. So um, we'll just start at least from my clockwise. Uh, Gigi, do you want to start and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Gigi Pondian. Um, I am a mystery novelist who writes the Accidental Alchemist Mysteries, the Jaya Jones Treasure Hunt Mysteries, uh, Locked Room Mystery Short Stories, and I also have a new Locked Room Mystery Series, The Secret Staircase Mysteries, starting with Under Lock and Skeleton Key this year. Martin, do you want to go next? Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm Martin Edwards. I've uh, published 21 crime novels, the latest to come out in the UK towards the end of this year, and uh, uh, after that in the US will be Blackstone Fell, uh, and that does have a lot of true mystery element in it. Uh, I've also written non-fiction, a book called The Golden Age of Murder, and uh, I'm about to publish The Life of Crime, which is uh, the history of crime fiction, and therefore not a small book. <laughs> And next, at least, clockwise for me is Doug Green. Um, well, I used to be Jeff Marks. Uh, <clears throat> I used to run Crippen and Landry, and now he does. <clears throat> so if you want to see me, you can look at Jeff. I'm, I, I am the biographer of John Dixon Carr, um, a close friend of Ed Holt, who is the current king of, uh, most recent king of locker room and possible crimes. And um, uh, and I've, I've done a number of anthologies, so nothing like, like uh, Martin has done or some of the others of you. That's it. I didn't get that. <laughs> I said something nice about you. Oh, wait a minute, my phone is talking to me. Ooh. I'm not sure I understand. It just said he didn't understand. <laughs> Taking my phone off. And Tom? Um, yeah, my name's Tom Mead. Um, my first uh, locked room mystery novel is called Death and the Conjurer. It's coming out from uh, Mysterious Press in uh, in July of this year, and uh, it's coming out in the UK from uh, Head of Zeus in uh, January of next year. Um, and I've written a, a, a number of short stories for magazines like Ellery Queen and Alfred Hitchcock, uh, all dealing in some way or other with locked rooms and impossible and impossibilities. Great. Um, there will be links to everyone's websites as well um, on the YouTube site. And so you'll be able to check out their books in more detail and they should have links to buying them there. And I recommend buying all of these. I want every one of the ones I heard about today. <laughs> um, first question, first of all, how did you get involved in Impossible Crimes? and Locked Room Mysteries, and who or what title was your entry? Um, Doug, do you want to start? I think I know your answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it was John Dixon Carr, and uh, the first one was The uh, Three Coffins of the Hollow Man. Uh, and after I read just about all of Carr, I graduated on to Clayton Rawson, and then finished all of Clayton Rawson, and then read uh, Anthony Boucher's Locked Room Mysteries. And then finally came across by chance a copy of Hank Talbot's uh, Rim of the Pit, which Carr had recommended, but I've never seen a copy at that point. And at that stage, I was completely hooked. Uh, I thought that's the only way to write a mystery story is to add, add that to it. Uh, and I still haven't run out of them. There's still a lot of good ones being produced. Ask Gigi and Tom. Uh, Martin, what about you? Well, for me, it was a, a kind of offshoot of my general enthusiasm for vintage crime. I, I began as a very small boy with Agatha Christie and that uh, reading, reading Agatha uh, when I was uh, uh, very young uh, inspired me both to um, uh, become a crime writer uh, eventually and also to, uh, to love crime fiction in all its many forms, not just classic crime. And really, I suppose the very first one I read must have been Hercule Poirot's Christmas, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, a really great uh, impossible crime story, although Christie isn't really associated with, with uh, impossible crime. She, she wrote one or two. There's a, there's a pretty good short story called At the Bells and Motley, 
in the mysterious Mr. Quinn. But um, it was some time after that that I uh, I, I broadened my my reading, and uh, uh, that's when I came across John Dixon Carr. And, and as as Doug said, I I was introduced through uh, the Hollow Man or the uh, the Three Coffins, and uh, I became hooked on him as well. Uh, Tom, what about you? Um, well, I've got a I've got a prop with me actually. This is my this was my first introduction to locked room mysteries the television late night horror omnibus it's um uh it's a book that i came across when i was very young probably too young um it's uh um it was published in 1993 edited by peter haining and um the idea is it's um an anthology of short stories um which each of which formed the basis for an episode of a of an anthology series like the twilight zone or tales from the unexpected or uh, the outer limits those kinds of uh, shows that had uh, stories with a little sting in the tail and the very first story in the anthology is uh, it's included here as vampire tower uh, by john dixon carr um i believe it was also published under another name um terror's dark tower something like uh, like that um it's a short story that had a real impact when i first read it um at uh, at a young age um because it, it's got sort of um a, a real gothic atmosphere to it but also a very logical impossible crime uh, trick that it uses it's a trick that car reused in a subsequent story but um and probably objectively the other story is better but i have a i have a, a a real connection to this one because it was my first Susie, what about you um i love that uh doug and tom and martin went before me because my answer to this question is actually a combination of all three of theirs and so I, um, my, the, the, my quickest answer is just to say John Dixon Carr on the shelves of my parents' house when I was a little kid, um, because my parents had, um, my mom is an avid fiction reader and my father nonfiction. And so our house was filled with books and it was always the classic mysteries that were the ones that I gravitated towards, even though there was like so many different genres and things. My mother still to this day is so sad that I don't read all the science fiction novels she loves, but you know, there you go. So it was the classic mysteries that were my favorites and John Dixon Carr that who I discovered when I was a teenager. I just love those. But before that, laying the foundation for that, is really that I love the Gothic elements of so much impossible crime fiction, especially John Dixon Carr. Yeah. And for me, that really comes from when I was really little, I was obsessed with Scooby-Doo. I didn't just watch the TV show Scooby-Doo, but I made my parents buy me all the books. And when those you know, were done, I, I like wanted my parents to tell me more Scooby-Doo stories. And when I didn't like the direction their stories went, I made up the stories on my own to keep up these, but I love that, that you think it's a ghost, but really you get to do this unmasking. And mm -hmm. so that is like such fun to me. And that's still what I try to do in my own writing too. But so all of the classic mysteries on those shelves, the John Dixon cars, and really anything that has that spooky Gothic atmosphere, but the impossible crime rational explanation. Jeff, we can't hear you. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. I forgot to unmute. Someone had to do that, right? Mm. So um, you hear a lot of different definitions for what an impossible crime is. I know some of you probably grit your teeth when you hear people describing one thing or another as impossible crimes, and they're not. Um, for you, I'd like to hear from everyone what your definition of an impossible crime would be um and also um what to you is a locked room mystery versus what is a closed setting mystery and some of the others that are often mistaken for being impossible crimes martin do you want to start yes thanks jeff uh, well well I, I very much agree that a, a closed circle story is, is different 
from a locked room mystery. I also agree they're often confused and that confusion seems to be growing rather than uh, diminishing despite, despite the efforts we're all making as, as great fans of locked room mystery. The closed circle as I see it is where there's a defined pool of suspects uh, and and one of those people is is the culprit and and that that's the closed circle the the locked room mystery is um, is for me a species of of a, a broader subgenre which is the impossible crime mystery and and the impossible crime occurs where uh, somebody is murdered or apparently murdered uh, but there is some element to that crime which is impossible either the weapon has disappeared inexplicably or nobody could have accessed the place where the crime was committed for instance because the body is found in a locked room or because the body is found in some pavilion in the garden that's surrounded by snow and there's no footprints on the on the snow or maybe uh, the body is found on the beach and there are no footprints in the sand it's the same same concept just uh, a different time uh, time of year really but there's got to be some element of apparent impossibility uh, and and uh, and therefore the paradox, this couldn't have happened, and yet it did. What is the explanation? That, that to me is the hook of the locked room mystery of the impossible crime, and it's what appealed to Chesterton. The paradox uh, idea was, was something he was very keen on, of course, and, and it appeals to me as well. So it's, it's that element of impossibility. It couldn't have happened, but it did. So how? Why? What? What's the explanation? That, to me, is the essence of the uh, uh, locked room or impossible crime story. So I, I would love to jump in, actually, because I have a follow up question for Martin. And actually, this is for all of you that because you were actually making a distinction between impossible crime being the umbrella term and locked room mysteries being a subset. So I am with you that I agree that there is confusion that a closed circle mystery is something else that that you know just means you're in an isolated setting that it has to be one of the people there that but that there's confusion there but even though they often the stories often overlap you know because you could have an impossible crime at a closed circle setting. But what I would like to ask everyone is that I am of the opinion that locked room mystery and impossible crime are synonyms because locked room mystery just is a way to, you know, to say that something is an impossible crime. Um, so that is my opinion and feel free to disagree with me, but I am throwing <laughs> that out there to see what everybody thinks. Yeah, I, 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 I go along with that really. I, I think as I say, technically, it's a subspecies of impossible crime, but but actually it's perfectly reasonable to, to call an impossible crime story a lot true mystery. So, so I do agree with that. Well, I don't agree entirely because I think the impossible disappearance uh, is so different in so many ways. Carl loved, Carl always said that was the most important of the miracle problems and the most difficult one to handle, which may be why he handled it the same way every time. Uh, <laughs> But it is, a, it is very difficult to have someone who goes into a room and is gone. And there's no, uh, you know, no exit, no windows that are open, no fireplace available to jump into or anything else. Uh, how, can, how in the world can you resolve that? Um, and I think that fits into a somewhat different category of, of locking up a room or uh, you know, someone managing to get killed in an unapproachable place or something of that sort. Um, but I, you know, I think they're all part of the same thing. The the miracle problem. If you look at something like um, Hey Talbot's Room of the Pit, he tries them all. I mean, just about every impossibility you can think of, he tosses in there, um, <laughs> including a Wendigo flying behind you and all all sorts of things. I'm not sure where you category that. Uh, but uh, I think the whole, you know, Bob Eighty, the great expert on impossible crimes, locked rooms, always said the reason we read them is we know there's going to be a puzzle there. We don't think there's going to be something given away halfway through. We're not going to follow how the how the mass murderer accomplished everything. We know there's going to be something that's going to challenge us. And I think that's where you can pull the impossible crime and the miracle problem and, and the vanishing and the locked rooms all sort of together because they all play a role in that. Yeah, I mean, 
I personally, I do use locked room mystery and impossible crime interchangeably, although I think that's probably because, uh, to my mind, locked room mystery is the sort of um, uh, the sort of purest example of the impossible crime, the, the kind that uh, your, your imagination can immediately latch on to, perhaps. Um, so it, it's when when discussing it with with sort of uh, casual readers or, or fans of, uh, of crime fiction more generally, it, it's uh, it's a good way to uh, to introduce the topic in a, in a way that um, uh, that you can latch on to, even if you've not delved into all the, the different manifestations of the impossible crime. And Gigi, you had talked a little bit before about some of the supernatural elements and things like that. Uh, what type of elements do you like to see in your impossible crime? Uh, Doug had mentioned the ones where someone walks into a room and disappears. You'd mentioned the supernatural. And then the follow-up question that would be, um, if you had to give someone one title, um, that really is one of your favorites, um, what would it be? Yeah, so I, um, I, as you said, I touched on this a little bit before that my absolute favorite locked room mysteries are the ones that have um, some seemingly supernatural uh, explanation because those, you're not just getting a cerebral puzzle, but you're also getting this like gothic, you know, grand sweeping story, you know, with like castle ruins or, you know, a cliffside where witches were once hung centuries ago or some sort of really spooky, mysterious atmosphere that you can really get swept up in, but yet you know that there is a puzzle there that's going to be resolved. And that's actually one of the reasons why, um, my favorite John Dixon Carr star stories are the ones that he wrote under that name as opposed to his Carter Dixon pseudonym is that I feel like the ones, the John Dixon Carr ones, he really wrote like some really like creepy Gothic elements into to those ones a lot more. So those ones are my favorites of his. So um, it's really hard. I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I think would be, you know, great places that entry points. For John Dixon Carr, I don't actually think that uh, the hollow man or the three coffins, one title was the US, one was in the UK. I don't actually think that that's the best place for a beginner to start because there is this big locked room lecture in there that's really fun, but is kind of like takes you out of the story too. So you already need to be a fan of the genre. So one of my favorites is The Burning Court um, as an entry point. So um, because it has all of the elements I love, plus a brilliant solution, it's a little bit, has a little bit of a different ending, but it's still fantastic. But I would also say the television show, Jonathan Creek um, mm -hmm. is also, I absolutely love that show. Um, it's a couple decades old now, but you can find it on streaming services. And it, it does the same thing, that it has all of those seemingly supernatural setups um, that have to be solved. So it's absolutely brilliant. I have, I have a list of a lot more, so maybe we want to talk about it at the end. But I will stop there because I'm rambling and other folks need to talk. So I want to hear their answers too. Um, Tom, what about you? Um, well, my taste is actually very similar to yours, Gigi. Uh, what I love is the... The gothic as well. I think it, it probably stems back to my introduction to the genre being both a locked room mystery and a horror story at the same time. But um, uh, I think uh, atmosphere is so important. Um, Carr was definitely the, the uh, one of the very best that I've ever come across um, at, uh, at conjuring up an atmosphere. But uh, ironically, I think um, in terms of an entry point to the genre, um, I know the Carter Dixon books are um, perceived as being uh, a bit more comic, perhaps a bit more playing up the farcical elements. But I think the first couple are really um, successful at conjuring up an atmosphere. So the first being, or I'm thinking of the Henry Merivale series. So the, the first being uh, the Plague Court murders um, and then the, the second being the Red Widow murders. I think both of those um, strike a, a very effective balance really between that, uh, that sinister um, uh, sort of phantom killer 
uh, element and uh, and the more the more logical uh, deductive side mm -hmm. and they're very entertaining as well uh, and also i have to say i do love jonathan creek as well it's a fantastic show <laughs> uh, the um uh, some of the tricks in there um uh, are just brilliant because they work they work visually but i uh, but i think they would also they, they would also work really effectively in, in novel form as well i think they're really good so martin you're actually writing about the history of the genre so i'm expecting big things from you on um, what titles you would recommend to someone well um i i definitely go along with uh, uh, what Gigi said about uh, uh, the gideon fell novels the john dixon car novels and the atmosphere and what she and tom said about jonathan creek which was so fascinating because it reinvented the lot true mystery at a time when many people thought it was gone it was gone forever and indeed even in the 40s in, in murder for pleasure howard aycraft who's a great expert and historian was saying even then that the lot true mystery was played out and was warning people off it but jonathan creek uh, david renwick the writer shows shows just what you can do with with a touch of imagination but if i had to pick a single novel uh, not in any way a conventional lottery mystery, but, but for atmosphere and mystery and, and the bizarre. I think I'll go for The Red Right Hand by Joel Townsley Rogers, which uh, is, is a book that I've, I've read numerous times. And uh, uh, it's a very rich book. Uh, uh, it's certainly his masterpiece and, uh, and um, quite unforgettable, I think. So, so that will probably be my number one pick. Yeah, I agree with Gigi about about the burning court. Uh, in my biography of Carr, I said, I thought it probably was his best work. I'm not sure I'd stick with that entirely at the moment, but I did commit myself on paper anyway. I would not use it as the introduction though, because mm. of the final solution that Carr brings in there, twists everything around in a very unexpected way that is not entirely uh, rational or at least materialistic. Uh, in, in the biography, I pointed out that my, my late brother came up with yet another solution to the whole thing that changed things around yet again. Uh, I'm not sure anyone ever agrees with that except me, but I would certainly um, uh, think that the, the Burning Court is at the very, very top of everything so beautifully done in it. And the irony is that his British publisher, Hamish Hamilton, asked Carr to write a book that had ordinary people in an ordinary setting. And that's what he came up with. It's not ordinary people. It's not an ordinary setting. But uh, and and Hamish Hamilton said, "My goodness, you're an inventive cove." Uh, when the book finally came in, um, I, of of car things, I would certainly latch uh, latch on to the Judas window, um, even though there's less atmosphere in that. And even though I point out in the biography, a lot, couple things don't work. Uh, but he covered them so well in the telling that you couldn't really. Uh, notice the problems in it. And I would go in a different direction. I love Jonathan Creek. Uh, Ed Hoke and I um, exchanged videotapes of Jonathan Creek for years. We both had contacts in England who would send us and we, both of us finally got these all region players so we could actually watch them. Uh, and I, I like them very much. Although some of them are not so quite so creepy. Remember the one that a, a, a message turns up in the sand and a bottle had been put in there empty, things like that. And I do think that such shows as um, Death in Paradise, which has an impossible crime about two thirds, three quarters of the time without any of the atmosphere still works uh, because in part, and this is, this is ironic, it's almost contradictory, but because the setting is so foreign to most of us and we don't know that island very well, we don't know how it works there, that weird things can be acceptable in a place that's not familiar to us. So I think impossible crime is fairly uh, um, accessible in different ways, uh, but I would still go back to, I, I do like the Gothic too. Um, for the authors among us, how do you start writing an impossible crime story? Do you start with plot, character, setting? Um, Gigi, do you want to start us off and tell us how you start one? Sure. Um, I start with a paper notebook. I don't have an answer to which comes first between setting or plot or the twist or characters because that can be, it varies, you know, between all of my books and stories. 
But the, the thing that is the same whenever I'm working on a locked room mystery is that it takes, I really have to work out what's going on before I start writing at the computer. So I'll, I have so many paper notebooks that are just filled with ideas and, you know, things that might work and, you know, settings and things, but I really, because it is um, the, the locked room mystery genre, it does rely so much on having that satisfactory puzzle resolution that it's wonderful when all of the, the the books and shows that we're talking about, they have so much more than that, that they have great settings and characters and things that really bring it to life, but they will still fail if you don't have that puzzle twist that is satisfying that you've laid out and then have the solution that you've hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. So I really, I need to work out on paper and there's still one story. Sometimes that comes quickly, but I still, there's one story that I started working on, on a trip um, in 2007 <laughs> and no, not 2007. Was it that long ago? It was many, many years ago. <laughs> and I still, and I started writing it and this was before I was, yeah, cause this was even before I was published and lots of my things before I was published a decade ago, I've, you know, been able to learn how to write well, but this one, that idea is so close to being figured out and I love the setting and I'm just waiting for my subconscious one day that will happen, but, uh, paper notebooks on the shelf. Uh, that's how I start. Um, what about you? Um, well, for me, um, having primarily written short stories for, for quite a long time, it's kind of a three part process in that what I have is uh, like Gigi, I, I've got a notebook which I fill with interesting little tidbits like um, unusual character names, settings uh, and, and sort of one line ideas like that. But then when it comes to actually coming up with a, a, a problem, or a puzzle to be solved, um, it will either be um, uh, from my reading about magic tricks and misdirection, uh, so kind of non-fiction um, uh, examinations of that, that I will try and extrapolate uh, a, a trick or a, or a gimmick uh, that I particularly like into fiction. Uh, so in that case, it's it's kind of it's coming up with a trick and thinking how, you know, under what circumstances would would uh, would somebody actually practically apply that in a, in a crime fiction setting. And uh, the other end of the scale, it's uh, it's the kind of the Scooby Doo angle of uh, a, a, a spooky story or a, um, you know, a setting or uh, something inexplicable, uh, which I then try and think, uh, how could how could that be accomplished? So it's either coming up with a trick first or the the uh, or, or the effect first. Um, it's it's kind of a, a um, they they sort of a, um, the inverse of each other really. Martin, what about you? Well, uh, until recently, I I thought that I would never write a, a locked room mystery in a novel. I've I've written over quite a long period, probably four short stories that uh, are uh, impossible crime locked room mysteries of one kind or another. I I wrote uh, an early short story in my Harry Devlin series, which was an impossible disappearance, which was a relatively conventional impossible disappearance story, uh, but, but very much of that, that type. Um, and then uh, I've, I've written uh, a couple of short stories that play games with the idea of the impossible crime. There's one called Waiting for Godster, which um, Otto Penzler included in his uh, big book of Impossible Crime Mysteries, and I was I was very entertained when he he put it in a category of its own right at uh, right at the end of the book because it it, it is an unusual story and uh, great fun to write once I had the idea uh, and and another interesting idea came to me uh, quite recently uh, for uh, an impossible uh, crime story of a type set on the Queen Mary, the old Queen Mary in the 1930s. So I wrote um, a story called The Locked Cabin. But, but more recently, with my Rachel Savonek uh, series, which is set in the 1930s, I thought it would be good to have a lot true mysteries uh, integrated within the, uh, the novel. 
Uh, and this particular mystery is, is a subplot, it's not the main puzzle, but uh, an idea for misdirection occurred to me. It is a genuine lot true mystery. There are, there are uh, two disappearances more than 300 years apart from, from a gatehouse outside an old tower. Uh, and then, uh, then a person in, in the present of the novel, 19, 1930, goes uh, to stay in that gatehouse, first person who's ever been brave enough to do so. And, and that person disappears as well. So that was an idea that, that came to me as part of thinking about the novel. And, and I was so uh, excited by it that I, I thought I, I would try to blend it into the novel. And, um, and I'm, uh, I'm happy with the way it worked out. So it'll be interesting to see how, how readers react to it when, when the book is published. And that's, that's the book called Blackstone Fell. Hmm. So if I if I were looking for the perfect setup for impossible disappearances, I think I'd go back to um, a Herbert Breen's uh, a wild, what's a Wilder's Walk Away, which every generation a member of this family disappears. I think it's three times, four times, something of that sort, and there's always a slightly different explanation each time. Um, he tries to get into the Gothic. He's not quite as good at it as, as some other writers, but the problems are set up so beautifully that you're at the end just shaking your head and said, this couldn't happen, as I did with Hey Talbot as well. I just could not accept the building up of all of these one after another after another. It just, just struck me as it couldn't work, but it did in both cases. I would also say that um, how you decide on where, where you're going to start, um, Carr always started with the problem. Well, how can I make this work? How can this happen? And then what trick can I use? And then most of the time from his early works, he came up with the masculine mysteries. The so masculine mysteries had a lot of things you could do with them, uh, the, the, the magic shows and all the rest of it. And then he'd work out what kind of a place might this have happened in. And that would lead to his Gothicism and all the rest of it. But I know some other writers tell me they start with a place or they start with a character. And sometimes they say, I don't know who done it until I reach the last chapter, which always struck me as a weird way to write a mystery to myself. But some people have told me exactly that. But I don't think you can do that with a locked room mystery. You really have to have it under, under your control from the beginning. I think you can be wrong about who did it, though. So the puzzle, you have to know. Oh, you can, I, you can, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Car sometimes had five different solutions. And of course, yeah. if you're Colin Dexter, though he never did any locked rooms, we have six or seven of them in one book, uh, all of them wrong. Uh, but, and so I think that's quite possible. But I do think you have to know what you're doing. You can't just say, well, I wonder what I'm going to do with the last chapter. Uh, maybe I'll flip a coin. I don't know. Anyway, that's why. Um, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but um, I'd like to just go around and have you all tell me what you have coming out in 2022 for the people who are watching. Gigi, do you want to start? Sure. So I, um, the, my two most recent locked room mysteries are, uh, this actually came out in 2021, my short story, the locked room library in Ellery Queen mystery magazine in the summer issue of 2021. But I'm mentioning it because, uh, the new news, which is really exciting is that the story has been, uh, shortlisted for both an Agatha award and, um, an Edgar award. So that was really exciting. Uh, for that short story. And the setting of the Locked Room Library is at the Locked Room Library, which is a, uh, a private library in San Francisco that specializes in classic detective fiction. And that story actually did start with that setting. I hadn't figured out the puzzle, but when I came up with that setting, I'm like, this is such a fun setting. So for my new Secret Staircase mystery series, it's one of the settings there. So this is my book that's coming out this month in March of 2022 which is Under Lock and Skeleton Key. Um, so it is um, the first secret staircase mystery. And I'm, I'm really excited about this book because like uh, Martin and Tom were both saying that we all started writing locked room mysteries in short fiction because it's, you know, as we wrap our heads around it and become successful at that. But I had an, um, a locked room mystery as a subplot of a previous novel, The Glass Thief. But uh, in this book, this is the first one where it's really front and center. And since it's the start of a series, it's um, I just turned in the second book in the 
series to my editor and that one has um, um, a locked room mystery as well. And it's a, a murder with uh, one murder with four impossibilities surrounding it. So um, yeah, so I'm having, I'm having so much fun. Uh, yeah, expanding into the genre. And Martin, you have fiction and nonfiction coming out this year, right? That's right. Yes, in, in May and a little later in the uh, US, I'm, I'm publishing The Life of Crime, which is a uh, uh, history of crime fiction uh, across the world. Uh, so uh, so that's that's been a book I've been working on for many, many years and thinking about for a lot longer than that. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, uh, indeed, it'll be interesting to see how people react. It's been a long time since Julian Simmons published Bloody Murder, 50 years. So I, I thought it was time for another uh, attempt at uh, telling the history of the genre and telling it through the, the lives or vignettes in the lives of, uh, <laughs> of a whole range of different crime writers across time and across place. So, so that's, that's uh, something I'm, I'm very thrilled about, published by HarperCollins. And then in September, I published this book. Uh, I mentioned Blackstone Fell, which is the, the third book in the Rachel Savonake series so it follows up to Gallows Court and Mortmain Hall and this is the one with the lot mystery uh, subplot and um, it's a book also with a clue finder so like Mortmain Hall it has a clue finder at the end of the story uh, you find them in one or two of the John Dixon car books as well uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, uh, you can check back to see where the clues are planted uh, in the text. Uh, they're listed yeah. at. So uh, that's a lot of fun to do. And as Doug was saying earlier, that kind of book, you really do need to plan it. Mm -hmm. well, well, no, I don't have any fiction coming out because <clears throat> I've never consciously written any fiction. I've written some nonfiction, which sort of gets fairly close, but not planned that particular way. Yeah, I do have some introductions that I've written lately. Uh, one of which was for a collection of, of novels and stories by the now forgotten uh, H. Uh, H. Russell Wakefield, who was known in his own time for writing supernatural things mm. and quite good at them. And I was asked by a small press if I would read the detective things that he also did and comment on them. And I did an, uh, an introduction to, those, to that section of that volume. It's an omnibus sort of thing. And... Uh, I pointed out that he was a misogynist, an anti-Semite, and really an altogether, altogether nasty person. And that may be why the book hasn't come out yet, and why they haven't told me why they're delaying it. But I, it's one I would never read if I were told to. Um, 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 I... Uh... I've got a short story in the latest issue of Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. It's the March-April issue, I believe. Um, it's called The Footless Phantom. So it's a footprints in the snow, impossible crime. So uh, I've tried to kind of ramp up the atmosphere and it's it's very much a love letter to the car stories and the Hate hey, Talbot, the, uh, the, um, the Simon Ark mysteries by Ed Hope. Uh, you know all those kinds of things that I've really that I've really loved um it's got my series detective uh, Joseph Spector in it um who's also in my uh, book Death and the Conjurer which uh, as I mentioned it's it's coming out in the U.S. from Mysterious Press in uh, July of this year and then later it's coming out in the U.K. from Head of Zeus uh, and like Martin, I, I've uh, also got a clue finder in there. I've also got um, uh, 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 the uh, unraveling of the solution. Uh, I've got little little references so you can go back through and spot where the where the tricks uh, where the tricks were. And uh, I've also got a, a challenge to the reader in there in Ellery Queen style um, because I, I love that. I, I, I what I. Um, I think what I love the most about impossible crime and locked room mystery novels is the the um, the uh, kind of gameplay aspect between writer and reader. Uh, the the idea that uh, the writer is setting a challenge uh, for for the readers to solve, and it's can you beat the writer to the solution? So uh, so yeah, it's um, set in nineteen thirties London. 
Uh, my detective character is a retired music hall conjurer, so I've been able to really delve into the, um, uh, you know, the history of magic and all the kind of theatrical backstage bits and pieces that I find really fascinating. And obviously, you've got kind of a, a fog shrouded London setting. It, it sort of it, it writes itself. Um, so that's coming out later this year. And what are you doing, Jeff? I'm running this company called Crippen and Landrew. Have you heard of it? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, we have several new books coming out. Uh, the next book coming out is an Echo collection called Constant Verses, uh, followed by the John Creasy book. And we have another Ed Ho book coming out later this year, along with Josh Pachter's Puzzle Club, which is a combination of Ellery Queen's Puzzle Club mysteries and some pastiches that Josh has written as well. So those are the ones that are under contract at the moment. So, And, and then Vanishing. His solution wasn't any good, but uh, Carr read that book and did uh, A Graveyard to Let, which then had a very good solution. Uh, yeah. And then Ed Hulk Sort of wrote a short story with a swimming pool disappearance. And of all the types of disappearances in fiction, that diving into a swimming pool and not coming up and draining the swimming pool and no body, no clothes, no nothing left in it, has always struck me as one of the most daring of all. Yep. Um, that was all the questions I had for everyone. I wanted to say thank you very much for participating today. Um, I will be getting with you on where you can find this video and um, I'll have links to all of your websites and all of your books. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for setting this up, Jeff. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks. Great chatting with Thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Well, lovely.